Jordan, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's great to have you here. It's nice to see you again, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We have so much to talk about. And and kind of the big news is you just released uh, the 11th Psychop book back on January 20th. Before we talk about the new book, take us back a little bit and, and tell us about the series itself and what got it started in the first place. Yeah, it's crazy to think that it's been going this long, but it was originally it originally started in 2006. And I answered a call for entries at Torquay Press, which is one of the earliest MM presses. Mm -hmm. And they were looking for novellas with uh, with paranormal elements set in a day to day world. And that's kind of my jam. So I wrote it specifically for that call to entry. But the funny thing is, for people who don't know the series, the protagonist is a psychic medium who has a bit of a pill habit. And the drugs shut down his psychic abilities so that he doesn't have to see ghosts everywhere. And where that came from was I had a friend who was a paper hoarder and he hoarded all sorts of weird types of paper and stationery. And he had these post-its from a pharmacy or from a pharmaceutical rep with uh, a printing on it for something called Spectrosef. And I thought, wouldn't it be funny if Spectrosef made you see ghosts? But, you know, spec Spectrosef means wide spectrum antibiotic, clearly. But that's where the drug came from in the in the story, and that's really the genesis of all the world building is that post-it note. That is amazing. <laughs> post-it notes. You in never a paper know where the idea is gonna hit you. <laughs> <laughs> So where do we find Victor as Bitter Pill opens, and, and what do we have to look forward to in this story? Well, Bitter Pill opens, he's now working for a government agency that is kind of a psychic big brother, and he's working there because he suspects they have always been watching him, so he'd rather be on the inside if he, you know, if he has his druthers to, to know who's who's keeping tabs on him. And he figures that it gives him an in to explore a bit of his past, which is sort of lost to the foster care system. The prior novel, Murder House, had him doing his first undercover assignment. So he was playing a civilian rather poorly. But unbeknownst to him, he was picking up some more interpersonal skills. He's notoriously awkward throughout the series. And uh, I wouldn't say inept. He's, he's surprisingly good at what he does but inside he's cringing the entire time mm -hmm. and i think he grows a lot in book 10 interpersonally from having to live with another agent and pretend to be married so book 11 he's it's more of a classic psychop i would call it it's more digging into his past digging into ghosts there's a drug on the scene that psychics get so addicted to that they just do it until they die. And so he's trying to figure out what it is, where it's coming from, and what to do about it before it can spread. And ghosts are involved. I would expect nothing less to, in a psychop book than to have ghosts. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back to 2006, did you have any inkling that this would go for, you know, now 13, 14 years and 11 books? I had no idea. I had no idea. And, you know, the publishing landscape was so different even five years ago, let alone 14 years ago. Self-publishing wasn't even a thing yet, and the Kindle didn't exist yet. And, you know, my actually my very first book that came out was on a CD that they mailed people. So... I can't even believe the changes that have come through the publishing industry since since I've been writing. And no, never. I didn't know the series would have legs, as I call it. I, I mean, I knew there was something special about it. I knew the protagonist's voice was unique, and I knew his chemistry with the love interest was great. And I knew there were a lot of stories I could tell with the two of them, but I would never have thought they would. I could do it for a living, ever. Mm -hmm. That would have been, I would have been stunned and probably wouldn't have believed you if you would have told me back then. Did you plan it 
with the idea of a series or initially was it just there's this call and I'm going to put this book in for this call? It's exactly what you just said, Jeff. There's this call and I'm going to put this book in and oh my God, someone bought it because (laughs) I had this big Excel spreadsheet and I had a stable of stories and I would send them out and get them back and send them out and get them back and very, very like once a year would maybe sell something, almost never. And even though every time I wrote something and thought, oh, I think this is great, I would send it out and, you know, nothing. So even though when I sent out Among the Living, I thought it was special, you know, I thought that about everything. So as we writers uh, do, <laughs> we do, we love our, We love our latest baby. <laughs> what keeps the series interesting for you after so many years? I think that the flow. There was a time when I needed to write different standalones and explore different things because it wasn't fresh for me anymore. And I knew that I was going to regurgitate the same thing if I just pushed and wrote only Psycop. And I think lately I have found a balance where I am writing Psycop and one other popular series. And as I flow between the two of them, I, I get ready and eager to write the other one. So it's a good balance of having, you know, a a happy protagonist and then a sullen protagonist (laughs) and switching up between the two seems to fuel the, the writing flow. Where do you get the ideas for the books as you go forward? Is it something that triggers just out in the world or do you have like a list of things you want to put Victor through or some mix thereof? I think the ideas come from the writing of the previous book or the previous few books. So I'll hint, I I don't have an overall game plan, but I do have a game plan that started a couple years back. So the thing that I will write in Psychop 12 is something I've been thinking about for probably four years. Okay. So... I'm thinking on it for a while. I'm thinking, okay, how am I going to reveal this thing and how can I hint toward this thing? But I think my generative process involves a lot of simmering. And so I will have been thinking about, I want this to happen to Vic or I want this to happen to Jacob. So how can I start nudging the books toward it and making it feel inevitable? Mm Mm-hmm. How far out are you planned at this point? And do you know when this wraps up or is it just for as long as you have these ideas? I make plans. And then as I get toward the next step, I see it's all changed. And this is how I outline too. I'll outline a whole thing. I'll write the first chapter. I'll look at my chapter two outline and say, well, that's no good anymore. You know, because something will have happened as I was writing chapter one that makes chapter two seem not quite right. And so I plan, but then I have the flexibility to change all my plans because I discover so much in the process. So I initially planned a certain ending for the series where we uncover Vic's origin story and it's, oh my God, this is what, this was my past and this is why I am the way I am. And I figured, boom, that was a good end. But two things. I feel there's a lot of ground I can still cover with these two guys and a lot of exploration I can do. And you can kind of keep dropping them into different situations and they're still interesting. So as long as they're still interesting, I really don't see a reason to make it end. Mm -hmm. But it does mean I think I need to move the origin story up and make it not be the big climactic moment because I think there's only so long you can stretch out suspense until it becomes silly and tedious. Mm -hmm. So like I'm reading Janet Ivanovich's Stephanie Plum series. I don't know how familiar you are with it, but she's got a love triangle that's been going on since book one. And it's to the point where it's just dumb. It's like, just pick one (laughs) of the guys. It's dumb at this point. And I don't want it to, to be dumb that like, well, you know, Vic's got all these resources. Why can't he figure this out? He's not a dumb guy, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Is there anything you could tease us without going into spoiler territory about Psychop 12? I have not decided where it's set. And that's what I'm stuck on. So that's not much of a teaser, but it's it's where I am right now. I know who needs to be there, and I know what 
Vic and Jacob are going to proactively be trying to do. They're going to wring some answers out of somebody, but I don't, I don't know where. So okay. uh, that's kind of, that's kind of what I'm uh, toying with right now and trying to figure out. It's still simmering a little bit. It's, it's at the simmer point. Yep. <laughs> Let's talk about that other series that you work on. The ABCs of Spellcraft. Yeah, that's my new baby. <laughs> that one just started about a year ago. And you've got four out, and you've just got the audio bundle out as well. Yes. Tell us a little bit about the series. So the ABCs of Spellcraft started as a project between me, Claire London, Jesse Lee Ryan, and Dev Bentham, where we just wanted to write a cute Valentine story, and all four of us wanted to release a story at the same time and have like a fun little group book release. Mm -hmm. So we each wrote a book with the same beginning line. Nothing good ever came of a Valentine. And we each released our book. And I wouldn't have known it, but mine had legs. And I said, you know what? Dixon and Yuri have more to do. So mine turned into a series. And it was surprisingly well received because I think it's very different for MM and I was feeling like MM needed something fresh. And by that, I mean, um, I had been studying mainstream paranormal cozies. And I was studying their structure. I was studying their language. And I was studying their conventions. And I was wondering if it was possible to write an MM where the sex scenes were downplayed. I didn't remove them entirely, but they're definitely not super descriptive no swearing, comedic, and focused on screwy personalities and fascinating characters that are quirky and that you don't know what they're going to do next. So it's almost like it's almost like an I Love Lucy MM or something <laughs> happening, but with magic. And, and really allowing myself to be as weird with my humor as I want to be, even though that's a little scary and a little vulnerable. I think writing funny is hard because you, you don't know if you're going to put a joke out there and think it's hilarious and watch it fall flat. You mm -hmm. just, you never know. But having my narrator, he's so, he's so good at understanding my timing that every single line that I, I write that is supposed to be comedic, he hits spot on. Like he just gets, he gets every single thing that I thought was supposed to be funny. <laughs> he delivers it as if he thinks it's supposed to be funny too. Did you two collaborate in that regard or did he just read it and immediately know this is what this book needs to be and who these characters are? We collaborate a lot on character in the beginning, but I do this with all my narrators. I describe who I think the character is to them. And I talk a little bit about their motivations and, you know, if they have any quirks or something, I might suggest that too. So, I mean, he did get a list of who everyone was and how they should be. However, in auditions, I had a line that went, oh my gosh, how do you, you think somebody's going to pay you a thousand dollars for a stupid poem? And he replies to his cousin, oh, it doesn't have to rhyme. And this guy was the only one who read that as if it was funny, you know, and everyone else just sort of flat out read it. And I knew like, well, the one guy who understood that was a joke there is the one I want to use, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I definitely hear, you know, his, his rhythms as I write those characters now too. Given that this started from the same prompt as your other authors did in that Valentine series, did that essentially set off how Spellcraft created itself? Or was this bubbling around somewhere for you before the prompt came up? I understand what you mean. No, I think it was sparked by the greeting card and the Valentine. Because the premise of Spellcraft is that you need two people to, to work the magic. You need someone to paint an image and that harnesses the magic and you need someone else to write words on top of the image and that directs the magic and a greeting card was the perfect place to have that combination take place. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I should say Nick Hudson is the name of my super fabulous narrator. 
and and new to mm as we were talking about too before we actually pushed the record button yes he he's got experience doing cozies and mysteries but he's never done an mm before so nick hudson is his mm narrator name cool. and i i can't imagine a more perfect dixon pen just just nails it and i'm excited that you're bringing more cozy to mm because i think cozy at least to me seems underrepresented in the mm market not just in mm paranormal but mm in general i think there's not a ton of the cozy mystery type stuff out there very few only a few people writing it and i think that there is room for people who want something a little bit different you know it's it's hard to know how deep to drill down in your genre and whether you're being too hyper specific because it seems like well i have a gay paranormal cozy with witches it it just seems like you know (laughs) what's the potential audience there 30 people (laughs) i feel fortunate that enough people were willing to take a chance on it Mm -hmm. are they as much fun to write as they as they are to read and even to look at because the covers are ridiculously fun Oh, good. I'm glad you think so. Sometimes they are, and sometimes they're a little harrowing because I get that anxiety of like, I think this is freaking hilarious, but could be I'm the only one who feels that way. And and you really don't know what's going to fall flat or, or what people are going to get. Mm-hmm. Anything new for Spellcraft in 2020? Since yes. now that we've got Psychop 11 out, do we get something new for this? Oh, absolutely. I don't have a release date yet, but Spellcraft 5 should be coming out soon. And so the way I wrote it structurally is that the books are novellas. So they're about half half to a third the length of a, a typical novel. And each one is its own little mystery or, or romp. But They form arcs. They form distinct arcs. So the arc of the first four that went into the first collection and the first audio is the main character's uncle is missing. What's going on with Uncle Fonzo? And that arc is resolved by the end of the first four. And thereafter, there's going to be arcs of three books. And so the next three that are coming out is what's going on with Pinion Bay, which is the city where they all live. So there's there's something sinister going on in the city, and they have to figure that out. Okay. So, yeah, so each grouping has its own arc, and then each book individually has its own thing to solve. Calling it a mystery is kind of a stretch. It's more paranormal than mystery, but I'm calling them cozies because they take – the characterization and rhythms of a cozy more than any other genre that I can think of. Mm -hmm. Both your series involve a lot of world building. What's your approach to building the world so that it's there and doesn't overwhelm the reader as they try to figure out the world? And what kind of research do you do to build this stuff or is it just all top of the head? I feel bad when people ask me how I do my world building because it's just so instinctive for me. Um, And I think, as far as I can tell, I think my process is that when I when I lay down a rule, like if I say you can't you can't destroy a piece of spellcraft because it will set it could set the magic. You don't know could be doing opposite what you think you're trying to do. So now that I say you cannot destroy spellcraft, going forward. You can't destroy spellcraft. So what does that mean? Well, I could have someone destroy one and have it boomerang. Or what I did do is I had uh, my protagonist make a business out of unmaking them, which is which is the correct way to to dispose of them. But the things I say, the things I like, kind of draw a line in the sand and say this is the way it is. Then I'm stuck with that going forward, and I have to figure out ways around it or figure out ways to incorporate it. So. It's almost like a snowball rolling down a hill. I just start with this little crumb of an idea, and then it gets bigger and bigger as I extrapolate on it logically and and try to see it through to its logical end. Mm -hmm. But not planned. (laughs) Not planned at all. Are you generally a pantser? I think I'm a combo writer in that I, I do know where the stories are going to end. 
I generally know what the climactic scenes are. From reading Save the Cat, I've actually found a new point that I write toward that isn't the climax, but it's it's the false victory. Mm. The moment of ta-da and everything's great, but it's not. <laughs> I For some reason, that's a stronger shining moment in my mind of of where the protagonist thinks they're they're good and they're they're really not good and it's a more interesting part because i think the twists come out of that interesting so i'm i'm a semi planner but like i said i come up with stuff as i'm writing that turns out to be really important that i have to then incorporate in spellcraft which is more comedic there are usually like running running gags going through that I, you can't plan a running gag, I don't yeah. think. It has it has to naturally come out of the text. For some reason, I've noticed everyone's been saying, Pinion Bay is not a thriving metropolis. And I one day I just said, I wonder how many times that has actually been said in the series. And, you know, looking back, I'm like, yeah, that's pretty much how everyone describes Pinion Bay. <laughs> <laughs> but these things come out, evolve organically, I think. Mm-hmm. Going back in time for you a little bit, what got you started as a writer? I was a voracious reader of high fantasy and urban fantasy. And when I got my first computer in 1999, and it was a Bondi Blue iMac, I did two things. I put Photoshop on that sucker, and I learned how to Photoshop, and I started writing. It just was an impulse in me that I I think with a computer, it's the ability to delete and redo as many times as I need to Mm. freeze up my creativity in a way that using traditional materials, there's always the thought that I could ruin something by making the wrong mark or writing the wrong word and knowing that I can assemble and reassemble and redo and change as many times as I want, which is what the computer allows me to do. Uh, really opened me up to all sorts of different self-expression. And those blue IMAX were so cute. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. (laughs) So the high fantasy paranormal material, is that always kind of just where your heart's been? Absolutely. Is that what you were reading? Yeah, absolutely. I'm not one for contemporary much of anything. I, I like to have either monsters or uh strange technology sci-fi mm-hmm. sci-fi-ish not necessarily space opera but like some of i i've written a little bit of sci-fi but they're more speculative like one of my older sci-fi works was well what would happen if somebody invented a food that ended world hunger how would society then change mm-hmm. or what if vampirism were a deadly contagion or trying to think what else I've written that is more sci-fi-ish. Um, I have a futuristic one called Zero Hour that was what if what if everyone was a clone. I have another one called Meatworks that where the the question is, well, what if instead of Wi-Fi and the internet and cell phones, what developed in the 70s, 80s, 90s was robotics. Mm. And so it's a world run by robotics. Were there any particular like books or authors that really kind of influenced you as you were in your in, in those formative years? I think Tanif Lee was probably my biggest influence. She had a lot of sort of androgynous, beautiful, deadly characters that that always seemed that seemed very much larger than life. And I think when I was a new writer, I I mimicked her style although it wasn't my style at all, turns out. But I got that all out of my system, you know, before <laughs> I published, because I wrote a lot, a lot before before I ever was published. Very cool. Is there something genre or subgenre-wise that you really want to tackle that you just haven't quite gotten to yet? I would like to someday probably do a disaster a disaster survival type thing. I don't know why, but I'm always very intrigued by that. I do love a good disaster movie. 
<laughs> I do too. And especially if they have to sort of make do, I was just thinking about lost. Do you, did you watch lost when it was on? For a while, do you remember, yeah. do you remember like in the very beginning when they were just figuring out how to be on the Island and they figured out that Sawyer needed glasses. So they found like glasses among the corpses and like soldered together two halves of two different glasses for him to wear. Mm-hmm. Just stuff like that intrigues the heck out of me. So I, I would like to, I would like to do a good survival novel sometime. I don't know when. That would be awesome. I hope you figure that out because I there's not <laughs> enough disaster type novels out there in the world in the MM world either. I can't think of I can't think of any. I can't either at the moment, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so please make one. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the best way for everyone to keep up with you online to keep track of future Psychop and future Spellcraft and all other Jordan goodies? Well, definitely you could look me up on Facebook or you can sign up for my newsletter at psychop.com slash newsletter. Perfect. We will put the link to that in the show notes along with all the books we've talked about. Wish you the best of success with Bitter Pill and all the good stuff with Spellcraft as well. Thank you, Jeff. It was so fun to talk to you. <laughs>